My official job this morning is to introduce Dr. Jose Bowen, who will deliver our opening plenary. Dr. Bowen is president of Goucher College, uh, but more important than that, um, he has been this brilliant teacher. Um, he has won numerous teaching awards at Stanford, at Georgetown, at Miami, and at Southern Methodist, where he was dean of the Meadows School of the Arts. He's also an accomplished composer <coughs> and jazz musician. He wrote a Pulitzer Prize-nominated symphony and has played with Stan Getz, Bobby McFerrin, Dizzy Gillespie, Dave Brubeck, and others. The focus of his presentation today is this book you see on the screen, Teaching Naked, How Moving Technology Out of Your College Classroom Will Improve Student Learning. We had Dr. Bowen speak to our faculty at our Student Success Summit uh, this past spring. And he was such a remarkable speaker, we thought it was worth bringing him back so that you could hear him as well. Um, he is uh, a brilliant educator, an engaging speaker, an accomplished musician, and a pretty good guy. Please welcome Dr. Jose Bowen. Thanks very much for that generous introduction. Uh, so let me actually start right off with a factoid where we were just we were just talking. What do you think it's worth to go to college? What's it worth to your lifetime income? That's an easy. You should know this number. Your trustees. It's a million dollars. So as a high school student graduating, you think we well, should just know you're making a million dollar decision. If you don't go to high school, well maybe there's some short term gain. You don't take out loans. But even if you take out a lot of loans, that's a million dollars over your lifetime of additional earned income. So if we were to send every student in the country or in your state to Harvard at full and pay for it, how long would it take to make that back in taxes? Four to seven years. Right? And that's if you had to pay fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year for every student. And most of your institutions are doing it for a lot less. So it's a great investment. Not only does it pay itself back um, in decrease in services, but it actually pays itself back in taxes. If you want to know chapter and verse on this, uh, the Georgetown Center for Employment and Labor has a number of very, very good reports. That is the place that has the statistics on all of this. Um, and so um, when you're looking for ammunition, I urge you to go there. All right, so you can see on the screen some, some stuff, some signs, some ats, some hashtags. So if this is Greek to you, I need to explain this to you. Uh, because students today are pretty different than when we went to college. Remember the card catalog? <laughs> Don't, right? That, gone, right? The, the, the world today is a very, very different place. And so my job is to explain to you um, how different it is and what it means for you. Um, this is not what faculty are used to, right? If you want change, you go to Silicon Valley and you work for Google where the culture is such that you go out of business a few times, eh, it's okay, you go work for somebody else. If, if your resume has no, doesn't say you worked for a company that went bankrupt, I don't really trust you. Right? That's kind of the Silicon Valley mentality. You, you're not, you don't take enough risk. I, I wouldn't hire you. Right? But in the college, we're still dressing up like it's the 13th century. I mean, we still wear the funny hat. I mean, we're still offering the same degrees we were offering 100, 200, or 300 years ago. I mean, I have faculty who still remember the debate about the English major in 1900, whether we should have one, right? So all of a sudden, the pace of change is enormous. There are um, changing demographics. The populations you're going to have are going to be very different. Um, and the, the, the types of degrees, you can't possibly keep up with new degrees. It takes four years, right, to get students through a new degree. For some faculty, it takes 30 years to think of the new degree, right? Then to test it, make sure, right? Because we're, we're used to having all the time in the world. So now we live in a totally different world, right? We've moved everybody to Silicon Valley and said, that iPhone 3, that was great. But you know, everybody else now has an iPhone 5 or 6. You're still using the iPhone 3. Nobody cares, right? The pace of change is faster. And that's a very different mindset and a very different sort of problem. So, there are three things I want you to, to start with. The first is that um, the value of an educational, of, of, of a campus, is faculty interaction. 
We have mountains of evidence when we talk to students on campus, when we talk to students 40 years later, it's a great study from Harvard. What was the most important thing that happened in college 40 years ago? Nobody ever says classes. Nobody ever says courses. But they do talk about people. They talk about faculty. Professor so-and-so cared about my learning. Right? We now have this evidence from the Gallup poll, right, the Gallup-Purdue index. Another great way to understand the value of college. So Gallup has spent um, decades studying workplace satisfaction. It's a bit of a proxy for happiness. Right? We don't normally talk about happiness in this room. We want our students to be happy. Right? No, um, we want them to learn lots of things. But it turns out that happiness is related to workplace satisfaction. Right? This is not a surprise. And that the single most important variable in workplace satisfaction is did someone in college believe in you? Did one person excite you about learning? Did one person make you believe that you could reach higher? So relationships really are the core of what's happening. And so you spend a lot of money on facilities to bring people together. Right? A lot of money on faculty and student activities, parking lots, air conditioning. Right? It's expensive. It'd be a lot easier to have everybody sit home and do it on their phone. Right, what we bring people together, partly because there is value in the relationships. But that's an important distinction. It's not because you're going to sit in class and take notes, like many of us did. Right? It's because you're going to have somebody know your name and be able to talk to you and recognize you. That actually has a lot more value than the content that's being delivered. So we don't drive to the campus to get more content. We drive to the campus to create community. And that seems a little paradoxical for an educational institution, but it turns out that's simply how it works. Second, technology is a tool, not a strategy. Remember, chalk is a technology. So if our strategy is going to be increase the amount of chalk on campus, right, that's not going to help. We have more chalk. Right? Your strategy is to increase student learning. That has to be at the core of your strategy. Increase student learning. Technology will probably be a part of that, but the real question is when, where, how to use technology. Technology is actually going to be very valuable. That's the thesis of this book, Teaching Naked, that technology is most valuable outside of the classroom. Connecting with students when they're at home, reminding them to do their homework, giving them something else to think about. When you get people together, what matters the most? You know the answer, people, right? Interactions. Um, so, Having fancy PowerPoints and whiteboards and all of that stuff is generally not the best investment. And finally, learning really is about change. The fundamental thing that goes on on a college campus is teaching people how to change their mind. It's not about stuffing them full of content, what I call the, 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 the sausage model of higher education. Right? Come to me empty and I'll stuff you full of more content. Right? That, that was what many of us had to do, right? Because the situation was fundamentally different when we went to college. Because without, tech, without the technology we have today, our relationship to knowledge was different. We all grew up in a world that was knowledge scarce, right? So if you wanted to know something, you had to go to this crazy thing called a library or look at the thing called the encyclopedia. Right? That was a fairly rare commodity. Right? People sell, sold those things. Right? Encyclopedia, look it up. Right? Knowledge was scarce. So when you walked on a college campus, you had this feeling of, wow, there's more knowledge here. There are more libraries. There are people. There are smart people. There are laboratories. There are more books. No student will ever have that experience again. So I'm sorry if it was a great experience for you. No student will ever walk onto a college campus and go, wow, more knowledge because they all arrive on campus with more knowledge on their phone than in any college classroom, than in any library, right? We now live in a world that is knowledge rich, which is not always a good thing. Think about that third piece of cheesecake you shouldn't have had. Too much rich isn't always good, right? So the world is now knowledge rich. It's also crowded with information. So all of that stuff on your phone, so you want lectures on, uh, on, on uh, molecular biology, you want lectures on, on Jane Austen, on quantum mechanics, from Stanford, from Harvard, free on your phone. You can get them now. You can pick them up, and I'll show you how to get them up in 20 seconds on your phone, right? But that's not mostly what's on the internet, is it? You've got, in order to get to that lecture from Stanford about you, how to start your business, you've got to get through a sea of cat videos. Most of what's on the internet is cat videos. A quarter of all traffic is video. And it's mostly garbage. 
which means that the value of professing, think about this, I talk to faculty a lot, right? So what's your title? Professor, great. Guess what? The value of being a professor has dropped like a rock because guess who professes more and better than you do? Siri, on your phone. She knows more than you do. She has access to more lectures and they have a Nobel Prize. Do you have a Nobel Prize? Those guys, the greatest teachers, the greatest institutions, all those lectures, all that professing is now free. But at the same time, the value of critical thinking, of discernment, of analysis, of being able to tell, you know, that was a bad lecture. That's bad content. I disagree. That person's just lying. That's an opinion. That's not a judgment. Those are, these are facts, right? The ability to find facts in the ocean of opinion Imagine if that was your graduation requirement, right? At the moment, what you do is you graduate people based upon butt time. Sorry, right? How long they sat in the seat, 120 credit hours, you get a degree. So at the moment, time is constant and learning is variable, right? We all, so you graduate, you graduate, but you learned more than you did. So we just graduate you based upon how long you sat there. Suppose we had the opposite standard. Suppose we said that graduation depends on how much you've learned. It might take you a little bit longer, right? We know that people learn it. It might take you a little less time, right? But if we graduate people based upon intellectual standards or about learning outcomes, so we could actually say you can only graduate when you can hold two opposing opinions in your mind without making up your mind. Or you can only graduate if you can tell fact from opinion from judgment. Imagine if you could only hold political office if you had that test too. Never mind. <laughs> um, but, but that's actually what's going on in college. And you're thinking, nah, He's, he's making this up. I say, so look, so a student posted this on my Facebook page for a, for a course that I have. Um, are you mad? Do you believe this story? Right, look at the, if you look at the, the site here, right, it says, the news nerd, that's a, that's a satire site. This isn't real. So don't, don't be mad, y'all. It's not real. This is just satire. So think about this. Siri knows more than any professor on the planet and has no idea what satire is. Right? Has no way to tell fact from satire. So our students don't know this. So again, they've got this, we've handed them this amazing tool. Here's a tool, all the world's knowledge right here. The British Library, the Library of Congress, um, the Louvre, all of this stuff is in your pocket. But it only works if you know how to tell fact from satire. Right? And you're thinking, okay, but those are students. Adults don't get this wrong. Um, so this would be the police chief in Annapolis who put his hand on a Bible and testified before the legislature that 37 people were killed in Colorado on the first day of marijuana legalization. He testified for this with his hand on a Bible. His problem? He used this source. That's the daily current. Is that how you spell current? Wrong kind of currents. Sorry, um, and you think, well, but surely the CNN or the BBC, I, I can rely on news, the media, sorry, I hope there are no journalists here, but, uh, right, but both of these stories turn out to be what's called user-generated content. Neither one of these stories has any shred of truth, but they were reported on the BBC and CNN <clears throat> because somebody, one of you maybe, posted this story online and then they, they adopted it, right? This user-generated content, we'll come back to that theme. Um, again, a lot of what's on the internet is from people who just, right, and is the, what's the barrier to, to publishing a book with Harvard University Press? <coughs> Pretty steep, right? Not, not everybody gets to do that, so somebody is peer review vetting it. But the barrier to putting something in the internet? Zero. Any idiot can post in this, on, with this publisher, so that means where is the onus of figuring out what's fact and what's fiction? You, buyer beware. The internet is the quintessential buyer beware atmosphere. So what we've done is we've changed our relationship to knowledge quite radically. So let me give you another couple of examples. So if I'm a student and I'm thinking, you know, I'm enrolled in class, I'm paying money, you would think, well, you're paying money, you should go to class. How little you know, no students, um, right? So what I do is I think, okay, I look at the syllabus, I, I tell faculty, what you should do is you should Google the items on your syllabus, because this is what a student does. They say, you know, it's cold outside, or it's, well, it's too hot outside, or, you know, I'm in bed with my laptop, because they are, right? They, if those of you who have children or grandchildren know, they sleep with their laptop, right? 
So you've got the laptop there in bed with you. And look, you could go to Yale in the bed. You don't have to get out of class and go to class. You could look. Courses. Look at that. Oh, I was going to go to economics this morning. They have economics at Yale. Um, oh, look, they have Nobel Prize winners talking about economics. Oh, he's on YouTube. This doesn't take very long at all. Look at how fast this is, even though it's my slow hotel Wi-Fi. I mean, <laughs> what, what, I don't have to do any. Look, there he is. Oh, my God. Oh, God, those jokes are old. But he does have wood paneling. <laughs> but, but as a student, I now look at this and say, well, maybe that's, why, why would I go to class and go to your lecture when I can go to his lecture in my underwear? I mean, that really is the choice. So for faculty who are still professing, there's a real disconnect because this is free. And you think, OK, but he wasn't very good. He's kind of boring. And you're right, he is kind of boring. But there are lots of people um, who are less boring. What if everything you did, thought, and felt could be communicated by pushing a button? It would be like in the world's simplest app, one that just sends out a little ping, always at the same volume and length, to communicate everything from it sure is cold in here to I love churros to boy, I sure would like to breathe sometime soon. Well, that is actually exactly how your neurons send all the impulses responsible for every one of your actions, thoughts, and emotions. When a neuron is stimulated enough, it fires an electrical impulse that zips. So why would you go to your neuroanatomy class? This guy also has wood paneling. He talks in 11 minute chunks, right? So he, he, and so in fact, students will do this, right? They'll look for the shorter video. He has production value, right? There are animations, right? So why does any anatomy professor need to give this lecture? I did this a couple of months ago at the, the, uh, the Human Anatomy and Physiolo Physiology Society meetings in Texas for the National Teachers of Anatomy, and there was dead silence. <laughs> I said, this is only one. Google, you know, the nervous system. Oh my god, there's a million hits. Yeah, there are a million different lectures. But these, this is called Crash Course. Um, these guys have money from the Gates Foundation. Right? There's lots of foundations now pumping money into this. This is pretty high quality. Right? And I can do this in the bed. I can, I can, I can get content this way. Um, the Khan Academy, you must know, the world's um, still the most traffic of any educational website <laughs> on the planet. But think about this. The internet can also do things that you can't do as a teacher. Most of us can only speak one language at a time. But your phone can speak lots of languages simultaneously. Right? So this is a site called Utiversidad. You may have a few uh, students in the state who, whose first language is Spanish. I'm taking, in this case, a course on Hegel. Um, and I'm having some trouble because Hegel's hard enough. Um, and here is, uh, let me just close this. Here, is, um, here, is a, here are lectures in Spanish on what's actually a fairly difficult concept in German hard enough in translation if English is not much, right? So the, the internet can be multivalent. I can learn things um, simultaneously. Um, but notice what a student does. A student Googles what's on your syllabus. And so I do this exercise with, with faculty. because I say, so you assigned 10 pages of feminist theory for Monday's class. What's a student going to do, right? I know what you all did. All of you went to the library, and you got the reading from behind the desk, and you sat there, and you highlighted. All of you did that, I know. So. Um, but today, students do this, right? They might, and you see, well, there's feminist theory, but you know, that's not what I want. Because theory is a big word. So look at the next, look, explain. Feminism explain. That's actually what I want. I don't want to read 10 pages of reading. In fact, what I will do as a student is I will spend an hour looking for a three minute video. <laughs> rather than read 10 pages of reading. So what I do is I do this, right? I type in feminism or feminine and explain, right? And I, I teach faculty how to do this. And I say, so you need to watch this, right? You need to know what happens when they type in. Hi, I'm a feminist. Oh, no. <laughs> Why? I want to get equal rights for women. You must be pleased with your success. No. Why not? The patriarchy. <laughs> the patriarchy? It means men control everything. And we need feminists to fight more than ever. So that's the first hit. Notice the number of views, 465,000 views. So what, what really should scare you, though, what I, again, this is the bit where I love, to, I love to blow people's mind. So you all recognize this as satire, I'm hoping. And by the way, you can, again, it's anime. You can do this as a, a site, extra normal. You just type in the dialogue, and you can add the hand gesture. 
So you can create these videos yourself actually very easily. So, but notice the comments, this, the people who are watching this actually don't understand. This is satire. They're arguing about it as if it was a factual presentation of feminism. <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't be laughing. You should be scared to death, right? <laughs> because what happens is students now arrive in class going, I got this. I got this. I watched the video, right? I didn't do the reading. Oh, yes, me, right? And then but they think they understand it. So my solution to this is to say, look, you, know, you can't beat them, join them. So you should be assigning videos to your students. So they watch them. I say, so everybody watch the Feminism Explained video before class on Tuesday. By the way, take out an index card and then write down three mistakes that she makes or that they make. What are, what are three things that are wrong? Critique what you see. Or um, what makes you think this is a fa these things are facts? Um, um, how would you know if this was satire? Right? Ask them a question. Then when you bring that index card to class, by the way, you put your name on it. This is how I take attendance. Pass it to your neighbor. First thing that happens in class, pass it to your neighbor, turn it over, write a rebuttal. Read what your neighbor has written, and then you write. Because what's really important is, can you be critical about what you're seeing on the internet? Because the, the real truth is, we can't teach them what they need to know for jobs in 25 years. We probably can't teach them what they need to know for jobs in five years, right? Things are moving so fast. We don't know what information you're going to need in five years. So our primary job is not to stuff you full of information. It's to teach you how to learn on your own. Our job is to create voracious, self-regulated learners. Self-regulated learners. Right? So people who can now find out new stuff. You do this all the time. Right? You want to find out about something new. You go online. You figure it out. But you have critical minds to say, this is good information. That's not so good information. But that's really the point of college. It changes way too fast. So when you think about your strategy, one strategy is let's try to anticipate the market. Let's give more petroleum engineering degrees. Because in May 2014, the degrees with the highest return on investment were petroleum engineering. Right? Actually, what was, the, what was the best, the most lucrative major to have at the end of the last cycle, at the end of 2014? It's petroleum engineering with a minor in Arabic. That was the best major you could pick if what you want to do is maximize revenue and return. Guess what happened in 2015? Not so much, right? It changes too fast. So if, you're, if you've invested in petroleum engineering, you're stuck. But if you've invested in being a self-regulated learner, the, the job that you will need in 25 years, nobody in this room knows what that's going to be. In fact, they're going to change jobs dozens of times. The jobs they'll have in 25 years have not yet been invented. You can't possibly know what skills they're going to need. Right? I mean, 25 years ago, we'd, Facebook, Twitter, right? my daughter has a job as director of social media. What? What the heck is that? Right? 10 years ago, there was no social media, and now you're directing it? I mean, this, is, this, is, this has happened incredibly fast. So um, one more to show you, just because they're fun. So if, if you put Charlemagne on your syllabus, you think I'm going to lecture about Charlemagne? No, you're not. They're going to do this. Right? This is the first hit. From a history professor, right? Here you go. Here we go. I'm, I'm sorry if I've ruined that song for you forever. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but but this, is, this, is, this, is, this is now where we live. Um, uh, one more. So there's, a, there's incredibly great content. So you think, they'll come to my string theory lecture, because where else could they learn about string theory? Is string theory right? Is it just that to This, by the way, is one of your physics graduate students with way too much time on his hands. All right, so there you go. So, so just, just look for a minute at this number in the bottom right corner. See that number? 2,600,000 views. This is why they're not in your physics course. All right, this, is, this is actually where they are. Um, okay, so there's, there's, there's plenty of content out there, 
And the challenge now is not finding a lecture on quantum mechanics. It's finding a good one in the right language, at the right length, that you think is credible. And that's true of all information now. It's all there if you only know how to, to access it. So that's one change. Our relationship to knowledge has fundamentally changed. Students, why they're in co college, why they're here, what they're hoping to gain, and what we should be trying to deliver to them. But there's a second equally profound change, and it's about social proximity. Right? Remember I said relationships really matter? They really matter on a college campus. We bring people together on purpose. But we've got to realize that the human brain and the human, human culture has radically changed since we were in college. Right? The meaning of friends will never be the same. And I don't mean to scare you, those of you who have daughters or granddaughters, but I'm going to talk about dating. Remember dating? Remember like boy meets girl, girl meets boy, right? So, so I'm a parent, so I have a daughter, post-college, thank God. Um, but, but my daughter calls me from a bar. Actually, no, I'm sorry. She doesn't call me, because why would they call me? She texts me from a bar. Of course she does. She texts me from a bar, and of course it's the dad, I'm with a friend. That's like the, my friend has a rash. It's like, yeah, you're with a friend, right? I'm with my roommate, and we've met some boys. Right, this is what every parent wants to hear on a Saturday night. Hi, Dad, read a bar, we've met some boys. My, friend, my roommate is thinking about going home with one of them, right? Yeah, sure, the roommate. And so I'm thinking, well, what do I say in response to this? And of course, um, she says, it's OK, Dad. Um, let's see if this pops up. I've checked on Hula. They don't have STDs. It's OK. Hula, the site that helps you get laid, the good people of Hawaii objected to this title. It's now called Healthvana. Health, what? Healthvana? Yes, it's where you put your medical records for your STDs so you don't have to have those embarrassing questions. You can simply look up somebody and say, they don't have gonorrhea, they don't have AIDS, they, they're okay. So my daughter has already done this. She's 21 years old, she's at a bar, she's met some boys, and she's already checked and say, Dad, it's okay. D Dad, it's okay? What are you talking about? It's okay. Right? But her idea of what's okay. Then, then before I can say it, she says, it's, and Dad, it's even better. Oh, my God, it's even better. She says, they get good ratings on Lulu. So how many of you know what Yelp is? You know what Yelp is? So when you're going to go to a restaurant and you might say, the other people, where's the best steak restaurant in Lexington? You go to Yelp and you say, best steak restaurant, and you find out not what the critics thought, but what y'all thought, right? And people just write, they randomly rate stuff. You know, everybody liked this place. This is Yelp for dating. Every boy in college in the state of Kentucky is on Lulu. It sucks the information out of Facebook. So you don't have a choice. If you're a boy in college, you don't have a choice. Facebook, your data has been taken from Facebook, and so your picture and your name appear in Lulu, which is an app for girls. And on this app, the girls can rate the boys, just like you would rate a restaurant or something else. And yes, it's remarkably explicit. Don't do this if you have a weak stomach. You could ask your children to help you, but they'll just be horrified. Um, in fact, I was, doing, I, was, I was doing this talk once to a group of faculty, and a student who was in the audience said, you know, actually, Lulu's like really high school. It's like, high school? Because it's very explicit about what the boy did and how well he did it. Right? So, it's okay, Dad, my daughter texts me. The boy's got good ratings. It's not a restaurant. <laughs> so then I'm, so I, of course, I'm trying to be the cool dad. So, honey, uh, what are they like? I text back. And she says, Dad, we haven't met them yet. We just said you were in a bar with some boy. I said, yes, we're talking on Tinder. You should know about this one, too. Right? <clears throat> Tinder is a GPS app, so it allows me to see who's in the bar of the opposite sex. If you want the same sex, that's called Grindr. Right? So it allows the girls, the, the girls to look and see, are there boys in the bar? And then have a conversation, hi, how are you? So they're at the other end of the bar, literally. They're in the room together, and they've done all of this. They've had all of this conversation. They've checked each other out. They've looked at their profiles, and they've not had a face-to-face -face conversation yet. But they're thinking about sleeping together. Yeah, you should be very worried. This is considered normal. This is the new normal. So students now arrive on college, and I, so I, I of course, say to my daughter at this point, I'm, you know, like, what do I say? I say so I text back, honey, those are strangers. 
Right? Remember that conversation we had in first grade? <laughs> Those are strangers. Those are the strangers. You don't know them. And she says, text back, no, Dad. It's safer this way. It means it's safer, rather than having a conversation with you, it's safer to do all of this, to figure out who you, so, so now let's talk about office hours. Think about office hours, right? Office hours, you're going to come to my office. I'm a stranger, because since you don't, you're not a friend with me on Facebook, I really am a stranger, right? So somehow, if you're friends with me on Facebook, we're not strangers, we're friends, right? It seems trivial, but that nomenclature is key, because it, does, it is about the psyche of the 20-year-old. Right? I met you online. Now we're friends. You want me to go to your office. You're a stranger. That's scary. So literally, going to your office is like the inner circle of hell for most students. It truly is. You have degrees I've never heard of. You have books. I'm allergic to books. They're all in your office. They're stacked up high. And you're in the basement. I was there on Tuesday. You weren't there. I don't understand. The internet is 24-7. Why aren't you in your office all the time? Right? It, just, it doesn't compute. So what I explained to faculty is that if you want to have better relationships with your students, you probably need to meet them online. Now, I don't mean on Tinder or Lulu, <laughs> but having a course Facebook site, a website for the course where you disseminate information, where you say, hi, I'm here to help you. So for example, one of the things faculty do is they have office hours. That's great. You have an office hour in the morning on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. That's useless, right? A, they're sleeping, and if they're not sleeping, they're working, right? You want to really help students? Be on Facebook from 10 to 11 the night before the exam. The night before the paper is due, be on Facebook late at night, the night before it's due, and say, I'm here, you can chat with me. A, because the barrier to chat is low. I'll chat with anybody. Clearly, my daughter will chat with anybody, right? Um, having not met you, so I don't feel afraid. That's, that's easy, that's safe. I can, so now I have a relationship with you because we've chat, we chatted on Facebook. We have a relationship. Now I'll come to your office. I mean, look, that's perverse, let's be honest. But that's how it works. And so understanding, right, you have to, right, I always, when I talk about teaching, I say, look, teaching is not about knowing more than your students. Teaching is not about what matters to you, <laughs> sorry. It's about finding out what matters to your students and then turning that into what matters to you. It doesn't start with what matters to you. Hi, I'm here, I know a lot of stuff, write it down. That's not how teaching works. Teaching starts with what matters to you? What do you want to be? What do you want to become? What matters to you? Oh, really? So we could, I, 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 then I can pull you in. Right? So social proximity has radically changed. We have to rethink how we connect with students, how we create those relationships that we know are of value. Right? So relationship to knowledge has changed. Social proximity has changed. And there's a third major, major change. And this is one that's also kind of invisible to most of us who don't do this, because I don't play games in, this, in the video game world. But video games have changed the world. Students now arrive on your campus, on average, having spent more time playing video games than they have in school. Assuming they have perfect attendance. Even with perfect attendance, they still spent more, 10,000 hours on average of video games for the, for the average freshman, right? Video games are an interesting learning tool. They didn't, they didn't say, hey, we're going to create video games that are going to be great teaching tools. They said, we want to sell stuff, right? But in order to sell stuff, they, they knew something very critical that faculty always struggle with. When you engage with something, the first thing you do is not, let's read the manual, let's read the textbook first. Well, the first thing I want to do is play. I want to actually start right now. I want to plug it in, and I want to have fun. Right? I don't want to have to read the manual first. So video games adjust individually. They're customized to you, to you, to you. They, they immediately change. So if it's too hard, it gets easy. If it's too easy, it gets hard. It, you find a place where you can actually perform in the video game without having to read the manual. So you've spent 10,000 hours of your life doing this activity that is fundamental to the way that you look at the world. And now you walk into a college classroom and it's like, hi, I'm going to talk for 50 minutes. Say it again. Hey, it's not working. My, my clicker's work, not working. You pause that guy. Rewind, right? All of a sudden, it's like it's not interactive. There's a person up here talking. And for most of you, when I taught when I did this for a fact, I say, look, for a fact, you're, you like this. You're used to this. You know, you're the people who were so good at school, you never left. <laughs> and by the way, that's really weird. 
right? That's not normal. Normal people want to graduate and leave school. So faculty, by the very fact that they're still in here, they're still in school, means they're weird. So don't use yourself as a model for learning, right? Because you learned despite all the other problems. You loved school. You're weird, right? For most people, it's, I want school to be more like a video game. Because video games turn out to be great, great teachers. Because they come up with a concept called pleasantly frustrating. Pleasantly fr a good game is pleasantly frustrating, which means it's not too easy, it's not too hard. Sounds very simple, doesn't it? But think about it. Think about anything you want to learn. Think about whether it's, you know, you're learning tennis, uh, you're learning physics, you're learning English, you're learning yoga, right? You don't want it to be too easy, too hard. What do you, and what do you do if it's too easy? What do you do if it's too easy? You quit. What if it's too hard? Yeah, yeah. The rest of you are lying. Right? Think about it. Hi, welcome to yoga. This month, we'll be practicing the inhale. If you stick with it, we'll get to the exhale next month. <laughs> it's like, what? i got to spend a whole month on the inhale? I quit. Right? Or, Hi, welcome to yoga. Please enter your headstand, push up into the handstand, hold for 20 minutes. Right? It's like, yeah, that can't do it. Well, quit. Right? So, when you walk into a classroom, you're looking for pleasantly fresh. I want to be engaged, but I want to be able to know I'm getting a little something. A game does that automatically. It adjusts for every person simultaneously. A game, you could all play a game right now, a video game, and every single one of you is at a different level. You're at level 20, you're at level 3,000, you're at level 2. Right? The game will adjust immediately to make sure that each one of you is having a pleasantly frustrating experience. You've had that experience for 10,000 hours, and now you've got this. Hi, I'm your professor. I'll be reading from my index cards today. Yeah. Right? And we, we wonder why there's any learning. Right? So, so, so the, and the customization doesn't just gaming, right? It's in all of our society, right? Any, any of you have reward cards, points? American Airlines, you know, hotel points. Anybody get hotel points from Marriott? No, you didn't, right? Yeah. Right. That's gaming. That's the gamification so that you, stay, you pick a hotel or an airline and you collect points or a grocery store. So the students are used to that. They're, they're collecting points, but they have some agency in that. And all of a sudden, you're just going to give me grades. So having a point system where students can collect points where they have some agency also encourages engagement. But this is a radical change. Students are coming into classrooms now not going, hey, this is a cool place. I'm going to learn stuff. Feed me. That is, that is just as far from the truth as it could be. Students are coming now with a very, very different set of assumptions. So one of those assumptions is about devices. So notice that they're using their laptops. You're not surprised. But in the last three years, from 2012 to 2014, look at the smartphone. This is use of students, students using devices for academic work. Right? This, look at what's going like a rocket. So students, now 68%. This is 2014. This is already you know, a year old data. This is from last August. So students are using their cell phone, not even a laptop or an iPad, to do the reading. So think about, remember that, remember that I showed you, remember I said, I said they'd look up, they wouldn't do the reading on feminism, they'd find a, they'd look for a three minute video, and in fact, if you go to Google, ask someone to help you with this, but if you go to Google and look up feminism, right, there's a little box that says more, you've probably never looked there. Under more, you can look for videos, and you can do duration. Right? You can actually limit it to three minutes, and only search for three minute videos, right? You've probably never done that. Every 18 year old on the planet does that all the time, right? But if I'm on my phone, think about this as a strategy. Right? It's a rational strategy. Why would I read your 10-point font on my phone when I could find a video? That's three, right? So they're looking for a video so they don't have to read your little text. So the other thing about kids that you've got to understand is that you should never borrow a, a phone from anybody else. Right? Um, here's what they do with their phones. Yellow means always off. So right, it's, the, it's the last thing they touch and the, before they go to sleep and the first thing they touch in the morning. Right? I suppose it's better than touching each other, but it says, what it says is they're touching the phone last before they go to bed, right? And this is what they do all the time. So the phone is literally in the bed. But the most scary thing, right, 30% of our students actually can't go to the bathroom without a phone. <coughs> People say, what's the strangest thing you learned as a college president? I say, the strangest thing I learned as a college president is that I have to have a plumber whose job it is is to get phones out of toilets. No, that's actually not the strangest thing I've learned. The strangest thing I've learned as a president is that they want it back. <laughs> My daughter bought a waterproof case for her phone. I say, why do you, do you go to the beach a lot? She's like, no, Dad, everybody has a waterproof case for, you know, when you drop it in the toilet. No, I, I, right. 
So again, <laughs> sorry, the point of this is that right, the world, it's a strange, strange world out there, but it is the world of our customers, of our students, of what we're trying to do. So understanding that world has become more important. <clears throat> and in the meantime, <clears throat> this is us, right? <laughs> now look, this is beautiful, this is, look at this Buick, look at this 1956, that's a beautiful car. And the problem is, is that it's 1970 now, and we're still a Buick, and Dots and Toyota and Honda have arrived. Now look at those little crappy boxes, right? No, are you worried about Dotson? Look at that. You're a Buick. Do you really think Dotson's got any? Look at that thing. It's not. But it's 1970, right? So those are MOOCs. Those are on for pro those are all the new products. At the moment, you could say, you know what? Online learning's never going to be as good. And that's what Detroit said. Those little cars are never going to be as good as our Buick. But what happened? Well, Dotson got better, right? Toyota got better. Lexus is a little bit more of a threat. Accurate, right? Infinity? We're not laughing so much anymore, are we? So MOOCs are three years old. Three years old! They're going to get better. Harvard and MIT have put $85 million into edX. Right? You should look at edX. Amazing courses you can take for free in lots of different languages from Harvard, from MIT, from Stanford. They put $85 million into that platform. Twitter was started with $5 million. So Harvard and MIT have brand, they have expertise, and they have money. And they are building a product that will give away content for free. They are going to be Lexus any day now. In fact, you could argue that they're already producing a superior product to many of our faculty who were standing up and lecturing and writing on the chalkboard. Right? You can get the old, and the lecture I showed you from Yale was not one of these edX things. Um, and it's every subject. So MOOCs are here, and my, res my response is massively better classrooms. If we want to stay in business, if we want to serve the students of our state, we have to have massively better classrooms. We might need fewer, we might need less class time. We might talk about hybrids. But the, if, I'm gonna, if you're going to drive to campus, if you're going to spend money on gas and on parking, and you're going to do all of that effort to come into my classroom, this better be something pretty exciting. It better be something I can't get on my phone at home in the bed. Because I have access to lots of great content I showed you. I've got, there are songs. There are songs in multiple languages. There's content. There's all sorts of stuff. If I'm going to come to the classroom, something amazing better happen here. So this is what I call the naked classroom. This is one of my rooms at SMU. Um, this, this was a 100-seat classroom set up in the business style, a bit like this with the fixed furniture. Right? Um, so I converted it, still 100 seats, I didn't lose a single seat. Um, but I took away the podium in the front. Um, this, is, this is this little, what I call the e-nook. Um, my faculty called this the diaper changing station. Um, but it allows me to bring a computer to plug in if I want to do stuff. But the chairs are important because the chairs here are, have wheels. We put little, little rubber things here so that you can't launch yourself into the next row because students like that. Um, but we also, the, these chairs have not one, but two cup holders. I don't know why, but uh, it's America. So, uh, but these, you can say, now everybody turn around and work in groups of four. And everybody can just turn their chair and they can do stuff. So this isn't an expensive renovation, but it does change the atmosphere, um, not having a podium, not having a center in the same way, and having students be able to work together. Again, if you ask employers, the Heart Research Associates study, what do employers most want? Right, actually, what they want, number one, is ethics. <laughs> right? Morality, what they want, number two, students who can work together with, to solve complex problems with people who are not like them. That's the number one outcome right after ethics. Employers want students who can work in teams with people who they disagree with or people who are not like them. What do we do in class? Don't cheat! Do your own work. The workplace doesn't work that way. The workplace is largely collaborative and our colleges are largely solo. Faculty, we're all good at solo, right? Remember, in order to be a teacher at one of our four-year colleges, you have to have spent five years in solitary confinement, <laughs> also known as a PhD, right? So this is the science. We now know a lot more about the brain and how the brain works. And so we know about how learning works. We know that personal is what matters, right? It has to be concrete and personal. It has to matter to me. You don't learn what doesn't matter to you. Um, knowledge is, is necessary but not sufficient. Right? There is content. I'm not saying that we don't have to have content. Um, but retrieval that to be a good thing. Right? Testing is great. The problem is high stakes testing is not so great. 
Right? High stakes lowers performance. But retrieval, we know, works. So I give a test before every class. Low stakes, but lots of retrieval. I make you write down and recall things. Also notice that games work this way too. Games are all about retrieval and self-testing. A video game is really just a series of little tests. That's all it is. It's a series of micro-tests. Right? Can you do this? And what happens though if you lose at the game? What happens if you fail at the game? Nothing. Right? You start over. <coughs> Restart. Play, right? So they're, they're used to an environment of very, very low stakes. Then they come to college, it's like, the midterm will be in five weeks. And if you fail, you're done. <laughs> I mean, that's not going to help anybody. Right. Elaboration uh, is very, very useful. Abstracting, right? Not just repeat, not just rote memorization, but elaborate, abstract. Failure turns out to be critical for learning, right? It is true that you learn more from failure than success. Um, and interleaving, which means that mixing of subjects, not always sitting in the same place in the library, not always, you know, don't sit and study the one subject for four hours, changing the way that you study, studying in shorter periods of time, all of those things we know now are the science of learning. So my teaching Naked Cycle operationalizes this for faculty. I try to get faculty to say, look, you've got to spend more time on the entry point. The entry point is what happens before you do content. So I teach a whole course on Wagner's Ring. Right? 17 hours of music in German. Are you ready? You're like, go and get me out of here now. So, so I used to write Gesamtkunstwerk on the chalkboard and underline it a few times. You know, bad strategy. Because right now everybody's just scared to death. What does that mean? Right? Do I have to write that down? What do I do? What are the rules? Right? Everything I talk, everything here is disproportionately beneficial for first generation and for minority students who don't understand the rules. Again, for faculty, they're obvious. You live here, right? You live at the North Pole. You live in what this, this is a crazy place. Everybody else is going, why does this work this way, right? So now I walk in and say, anybody here like music? Anybody like music? Let's talk about, anybody here like lyrics? How about music and lyrics together? Should, should, and what's the relationship between music and lyrics? And we talk for 15 minutes. Why? Because you care about music and lyrics. And so there'll be some, talk, and again, I, I let, it has to go for a while, and after, at some point, somebody says, well, you know, I really like when the lyrics and the music aren't quite in sync, when the lyrics are like saying, I love you, I love you, the music are going, yeah, not so much, and that's my opening. Well, you know, there's this dead white guy, and he had a really interesting theory about music and lyrics, that the, the lyrics appeal to your head and the music to your heart, and that those, dis that the, 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 the music was really speaking to what's actually going on, but the lyrics are what I have to say. What do you think about that? And we talk about, I never, don't mention the word Wagner, because that's scary, right? Teaching starts with what matters to your students, and it ends with what matters to you. So entry point, we, ne we never teach anybody this. This is actually really important. It's the motivational piece. But then there's content, plenty of content online. You can read, you can watch. Then there's exam. I give an exam before every class. There's writing before every class, right? I want you to reflect and evaluate what you saw online, right? Was the, re was the author of the chapter opinionated? Why? What was your favorite quote? What was useful? Then classroom is where we challenge. I add six, right? If self-regulation is the goal, I better do it in every class. And then I have a whole wrap on, re on e e communication, how to use Facebook and social media, which I won't go into today. Um, this is one of my exams. This is from the first day of class, so I, my recommendation is that you never pass out a syllabus, ever. Because the first thing to do is like, well, how many pages and who many, how many problem sets, right? The, the syllabus will be posted in an hour, right? You can, you can read the syllabus in an hour online. Right now, I want to change your life. I want to demonstrate to you why this matters. The first day of class is disproportionately important. It's about motivation. Oh, and by the way, I'll send you an email with the link to the syllabus which is so you should read your email. And it has a link to a test on the syllabus. So read the syllabus on your own and take the test, right? This is also sometimes called the inverted classroom or the flipped classroom, where, where I'm pushing the content out and then I'm holding you accountable before you come back to class. So this is my exam. I say, which is the, this is one of the questions from my syllabus quiz. What's the answer? Yes, number, number one, number two. Number three, yeah, well, number three is actually a learning course, a course outcome, right? Remember, learning is about change. I teach jazz history, right? The bridge is not going to fall down if you fail jazz history, right? 
Um, the humanities are sometimes hard to understand for what their benefit, but the humanities are where we look at the lens. How do we know what we know, right? In this case, I want you to fall in love with something. Because when you fall in love, you learn, hey, I didn't used to like sushi. Now I like sushi. <gasps> I changed. You can change. That's a really important outcome of college, to understand that you can learn to like something you didn't like, that you're not fully baked yet, that this process of change is going to continue. And 20 years from now, when you need to learn something new for a job, you will not only learn something new for a job, it will change who you are. Because now you like Duke Ellington, and you didn't used to like Duke Ellington. And so that is an explicit part of the humanities and a part of this course. All right, so new technologies here, I've talked a lot about it. What does it mean for you? The good news is thinking just became more important. And that's actually what we teach. Thinking got more important. The bad news, course design just got more important, right? The old model is, I know some stuff, here it is. Now it's, how am I going to present it? When am I going to do this? What happens first? What happens second? Your phone has all this content, but it's not designed in a way that will help you learn it. That's my job. Almost none of your faculty were, were trained that way. So you're going to need to provide a lot more training because course design <coughs> just got more important. You're going to need to invest in pedagogy because that is where the value is added on a, on, a, on a campus, not in knowing more than your students. You've invested plenty in making sure everybody has a PhD. Now you've got to invest in making sure they know how to teach. But the third part is integration, right? Everything that happens on campus is an opportunity for learning. If you're going to spend money on it, you need to leverage it. So that means athletics matter. If you have athletics, that's a learning opportunity. If you have dormitories, that's a learning opportunity, right? I took that religious studies course, eh, I learned a little bit. Having a Muslim roommate, learned a lot, right? Roommate selection, solving problems with your roommate actually was more important than anything I learned in college, right? So integrating of all of that, so it's not just the faculty, it's the learning that happens everywhere on campus. Learning also means you're going to, a new technology means you're going to need more flexibility of faculty workload, of schedules, how we're structured in a very old fashioned way. Um, we may need to be in here all the way, all year long. We're going to have to encourage more risk. Risk is a part of our future. You can't have innovation without risk. Um, we're going to have to better evaluate, if learning really matters, well, how do I know if students are learning? Course evaluations are not that useful. We're going to have to have better ways of, of reviewing teaching. And we're going to need, again, integration. What that means campus-wide is rubrics, learning outcomes, progression. Maybe you can't take the second year until you take the first year. Right? Again, it's part of this problem of the butt time and you hand the degree for the wrong part of the body. Think about this. The second year should be harder. The real point of college is not that you take more content, but that the second year is more complex. If the real goal, again, I think the goal of college is to increase the complexity of your mental model, that means every year has to be more complex. At the moment, we're set up for choice. We give you lots of choice because we're Americans and we like freedom of choice. So you can take the courses in any order you want. You can take history as a senior, take history as a freshman. Well, but no, the point is to have increasing complexity as we get through. So maybe I limit your choices for freshman year, but the second year choices are all more complex. And the subjects don't matter as much as the increasing pro progression of complexity. So you've got lots of disruptions because of technology. So I'm asking you to focus on value. Uh, I've talked about face-to-face -face a lot. Um, you have to think about what is the product? Um, what is it you're actually selling? I think it's learning, but you know, a lot of campuses sell experience or prestige, you know, the spa, the best four years of your life. Um, but mission, being unique matters more. You can't all be the same thing. Every campus should do something different. Um, being true to who you are really matters. Um, I like, right, nobody wants the same sandcastle over and over again. Um, so this is how I look at that process of creating value and finding focus, right? You have a product, you have curriculum, right? You want, I want you, to, you want to integrate what happens on campus. This is what you do. Then you have a brand, which is what people know you for. And then you have to have data, right? I, I actually, I, I recommend to you, I use the word assessment. With faculty, don't use the word assessment. It starts with ask. They don't like that. Um, but you are what you measure. You actually are what you measure. If you don't measure it, you don't know what's happening. But what makes this all work is student learning. That's the engine of what we're, that's really what we're trying to do, um, is, is to increase student learning, increase retention. All of those things revolve around what's unique on our campus and how do we know that we're delivering it. So I heard you talk about strategy. Strategy's great, but remember it's the art of sacrifice. It's really about choices. It's less about the plan, 
The plan bit's not as important. The, the important bit is what choice are you going to make? I, I'm a big fan of Roger Martin's at Harvard um, and the playing to win. Um, you're also going to spend the next five years, so once you have the plan, the plan is not going to be steady. Mostly what you're going to be doing is managing change, right? There's a lot of change. I cannot tell you in five years what majors you're going to need. So you could plan for that, but you don't know what you're going to need for majors in five years. So managing change largely means, again, don't use the language of assessment for faculty. They understand mission values. For all campus administrators, I say it's about positive cycles. Start with an early win. Build this cycle onto your campus. Be data driven, but start the cycles of we're going to change. We're going to do this a lot because there is more change coming. Um, but creating a culture of risk, again, innovation and risk go together. And finally, being student focused, right? When you start with student focused, you've got a lot more of a chance of getting faculty on board because you all know that's the big problem, right? Um, faculty don't like change. That's why we became faculty. We didn't want to go out in the, in the mean real world. We want to stay here on campus. Right? We don't like change. If I wanted to change, I'd go work for Google. And that's not what I wanted. So um, when you think about your online strategy, which I will guess will come up today, again, think about choices. Um, I would prescribe for you that you think always locally, right? What's called glocalization, um, right? McDonald's is all over the world, but they serve the McCroissant in Paris, and they have McBagels in Israel, and they have other kinds of things, right? Um, that you tailor the product to where you are. You don't want to go up against Harvard and MIT. There's plenty of online competition out there, right? You don't need to reinvent the wheel. But hybrid seems to add a lot more value, right? The dropout rate is a lot lower because hybrid includes the face-to-face -face and the people. Um, now, hybrid is not enough of a strategy. Say, I want to increase hybrid. That's fine. But the hybrid has to mean that when you create community, that's what you're doing. You're not just bringing people together to get more content. So we have a program at Goucher. Um, we have a series of master's degrees. But they start with the on-campus part. People have to come to campus for two weeks. It's only two weeks in the summer, so they come from all over the country. They spend two weeks, and mostly what do they do for two weeks? They live together in the dorms. They make friends. Now they spend a year online, but they know each other. And so the online interactions work better because they started by creating a community, and then they, ha they can support each other through that online learning. Plenty of online tools, but the hybrid strategy is not enough. You've got to make sure you, you take advantage of all that. So I end here. Um, with this idea that, that what you're doing in education is really lighting the fire, that you are trying to create self-regulated learners, people who want to go out and learn more, but who have tools to do that. Our mission has changed. We no longer have to stuff them full of content. We really can refocus what we do, and that's going to be a massive, massive change for the way we're structured, for the people in the organizations, for everything we do. But the good news, there's something here that faculty really love, right? Ultimately, what I say to faculty is your job is not to know more than your students. Your job is really to be an intellectual role model. Because when students are on the TV, they're not likely to see somebody who can change their mind. You're the ultimate thing for a, fact for a professor is to say, you know, that's a great question. You may have changed my mind. Because that models for people, wow, that's, that's what it means to be smart. Because people are confused. They think their cell phone is smart. They do. They call it a smartphone. Right? But Siri, as we discovered, is not smart. So they believe that smart are people who know more things. That makes you smart. No, you're smart because you know how to change your mind. And where are you going to see that? You're going to see it from faculty, or you should see it from faculty, who model for people what it means to be smart. You're the professor. You must be smart. So model, that means I know more. No, what that means is you may have changed my mind because that's what it means to be smart, is to be able to get new information and then change. Thank you very much.